gentlemen, welcome to Toe the Line's Pugilism Profiles with me, George Glinsky, a brand new series on the channel, moving away from the modern counterpart of BKB and looking at the history of bare knuckle boxing. Essentially, I came up with this series over the weekend. I didn't actually soundboard it off anyone, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, a bit of a risky one there, but if you do, like and subscribe and let me know in the comment section because this is the sort of video I just really wanted to do. I'm very passionate about history, being a former history student, and of course, bare knuckle boxing, owning this channel. So I thought I'd slam the two together, have a little bit of a look at the history of the sport and its most important figures. So today, we'll be starting off where every bare knuckle boxing history in England should start with the first ever British bare knuckle boxing champion, James Fick. James Fick was born in the small Oxfordshire town of Tame in 1684 during the reign of William III. Little is known of Fig's early upbringing other than the fact that he made his name as a master swordsman and prize fighter in his local area by taking on all comers at Oxfordshire fairs. At one such fair, Fig's talents were discovered by the third Earl of Peterborough, Charles Mordaunt, who offered to fund Fig's exploits. Through the generous donations of Mordaunt, Fig was able to move his business to London, setting up his own prize fighting booth at Southwark Fair. By 1719, Fig had defeated all who dared to face him and proudly proclaimed himself heavyweight champion of England, the first to be officially recognised as such. That same year, Fig would establish the English School of Arms and Art of Self-Defence Academy, known as Fig's Amphitheatre on Tottenham Court Road. Here, Fig would pass on his expertise of sword, staff and knuckle to keen students of pugilism and hold regular bouts and sparring exhibitions for public entertainment. During the early 18th century, bare knuckle boxing was yet to become a formalised sport. It would not be until 1743 with the establishment of Broughton's rules that prize fighting began to resemble its modern counterpart. Instead, the sport Fig frequented was more a mixture of swordplay and no holds bar fighting. Contests ranged from fencing bouts involving swords or quarterstaffs to bare knuckle fights that permitted grappling and throws. Fig excelled in all disciplines, particularly swordplay. He was noted by contemporaries to be a fighter rich in dexterity, resolution and bravery. A former pupil, Captain John Godfrey, wrote, He was just as much a greater master than any other I ever saw, as he was a greater judge of time and measure. Fig retired and vacated his English heavyweight crown in 1730, sporting a rather impressive 269-1 and one record. The sole blemish came in his first encounter with Gravesend pipe maker Ned Sutton in 1724, triggering a rivalry between the two gentlemen that was settled by an epic trilogy. Fig bested his rival on the remaining two occasions, winning the rematch in 1725 and the rubber match in 1727. The famous third bout was contested over three separate disciplines, broadsword, fist and quarterstaff, with Fig winning all three rounds to claim the contest. A report of the fight is recorded in all its glory by poet John Byron. Long was the great Fig by prize-fighting swains, so old monarch acknowledged by Marybone Plains. To the towns far and near did his valour extend, and swam down the river from Tame to Gravesend. Where lived Mr Sutton, pipe maker by trade, who hearing that Fig was thought such a stout blade, resolved to put in for a share of his fame, and so sent to challenge the champion of Tame. With alternate advantage, two trials had passed, when they fought out the rubbers on Wednesday last. To see such a contest, the house was so full, there hardly was room left to thrust in your skull. With a prelude of cudgels, we first were saluted, and two or three shoulders most handsomely fluted. Till weary at last with inferior disasters, all the company cried, Come, the masters, the masters. Whereupon the bold Sutton first mounted the stage, made his honours as usual, and yearned to engage. Then Fig with a visage so fierce yet sedate, came and entered the lists with his freshly shaven pate. Their arms were encircled with armagers too, with a red ribbon Sutton's and figs with a blue. Thus adorned the two heroes, twixt shoulder and elbow, shook hands and went to it, and the word it was Bilbo. Sure, such a concern in the eyes of spectators was never yet seen in our amphitheatres. Our commons and peers from their several places to half an inch distance all pointed their faces, while the rays of old Phoebus that shot through the sky light seemed to make on the stage a new kind of twilight. And the gods without doubt, if one could have seen them, were peeping there through to do justice between them. Fig struck the first stroke, and with such a vast fury, 
that he broke his huge weapon in twain, I assure you. And if his brave rival this blow had not warded, his head from his shoulders had quite been discarded. Fig armed him again, and they took two other tilt. And then Sutton's blade ran away from its hilt. The weapons were frighted, but as for the men, in truth they never minded, but at it again. Such a force in their blows you'd have thought it a wonder. Every stroke they received did not cleave them asunder. Yet so great was their courage, so equal their skill, that they both seemed as safe as a thief in a mill. While in doubtful attention Dame Victory stood, and which side to take could not tell for her blood, but remained like the ass twixt the bundles of hay, without ever stirring an inch either way. Till Jove to the god signified his intention, in a speech that he made them too tedious to mention. But the upshot on it was that at that very bout, from a wound in Fig's side, the hot blood spouted out. Her ladyship then seemed to think the case plain, but Fig stepping forth with a sullen disdain, shooed the gash and appealed to the company round, if his own broken sword had not given him the wound. At bruises and wounds a man's spirit should touch, with danger so little, with honour so much. Well, they both took a dram and returned to the battle, and with a fresh fury they made the swords rattle. While Sutton's right arm was observed to bleed, by a touch from his rival, so Jove had decreed, just enough for to true, that his blood was not a core, but made up like figs of the common red liqueur. Again they both rushed with as equal a fire on, till the company cried, hold enough of cold iron. To the quarterstaff now, lads, so first having dreamed it, they took to their woods, and I faith never shamed it. The first bout they had was so fair and so handsome, that to make a fair bargain was worth a king's ransom. And Sutton such bangs on his neighbour imparted, would have made any fibre but figs to have smarted. Then after that bout they went on to another, but the matter must end on some fashion or other. So Jove told the gods he hath made a decree, that Fig should hit Sutton a stroke on the knee. Though Sutton disabled as soon as he hit him, would still have fought on, but Jove would not permit him. Twas his fate, not his fault, that constrained him to yield, and thus the great Fig became lord of the field. Upon his retirement, Fig had already cemented a lasting legacy. Fig's amphitheatre became intrinsically linked with pugilism, and produced several fine bare-knuckle prodigies, including George Taylor, Bob Whittaker, and Jack Broughton. He was the first man to be widely recognised as the champion of England, and was only beaten once, which he avenged. Despite being noted as a keener swordsman than bare-knuckle boxer, he nevertheless brought the sports to the forefront of 18th century entertainment as part of his pugilistic deeds. His fame allowed him to socialise in elitist circles, providing Fig with the appropriate influence to popularise prize fighting with royal family members such as Frederick Lewis, the then Prince of Wales. He is without question the grandfather of bare-knuckle boxing, a sport which would be developed further by his aforementioned student, Jack Broughton, with the introduction of the Broughton Rules. Yet still, Fig is often forgotten when it comes to lists of great pugilists. Perhaps he is overshadowed by his finest student, Jack Broughton, or maybe it is the multitude of great bare-knuckle boxers from over the pond, such as John L. Sullivan and Tom Heyer. Regardless, Fig is one of the greatest swordsmen and bare fighters of the pugilistic era, and should be hailed as such. If it wasn't for Fig, perhaps bare boxing would never have reached the lofty heights it has today, and that is a scary thought.